Hey, good morning. So we're projectorless, that's okay. Uh, most of you should have the course notes that as I mentioned in class on Friday, they're uploaded for you to print out and bring to class. So if you're following through with those, you'll have them in front of you. But even if you don't, we'll, we'll try to make this work today. We're starting this part of the course with engineering economics. And we're going to be looking at economic issues related to processes and decision making. Quick question. Those of you that had a co-op term, or even if you haven't, maybe you have some background knowledge and experience. In your co-op term, what sort of economic decisions have you seen companies make? What was the sort of issues that they were considering when they were in a company and maybe buying large capital equipment? What was the primary decision to make an investment? So that's the question. What is the, the criteria a company is using to decide to invest in something? Yeah. Return on investment. Okay. Any other criteria that people have seen used? Long-term return. Okay, so how would, do you know how that was quantified? Over a period of time. Okay, so 20 years, 30 years, depending on the period of project. The key issue there is time. Clear? Net present value. So what does the net present value mean? Do you... Okay, so taking the time value of money into account, if that value is greater than zero, you'll accept the project. Okay, so there's three different criteria being mentioned and three criteria that are regularly used by companies. If you were deciding to make a purchase, one other criteria you might have seen being used in the past is payback time. How long does it take for something to pay back? for you, okay? So maybe you're considering buying a house or renting, okay? Which criteria, like if you, well maybe that's, let me rephrase that example. Let's say you're buying a house specifically with the view of investing it to students and renting it out, say here in Westdale. One criteria you might be interested in is how fast can you pay that back? Do you buy the smaller house that you can have three people staying at? Do you buy the larger house that costs a bit more, but now you can have six people in there? Which one's going to pay back faster? Right, so there's a fairly naive criteria is payback time. We'll see later on, a week or two from now, that payback time probably isn't a good criterion to use, but it's one that we often use day to day. If you speak with family and friends and you listen to how they're making decisions, often payback time, the time it takes to pay the investment back to cover your costs, before you start breaking even and making a profit is inherently used by people, okay? So what I wanted you to get out of that discussion is the one key important item, time. Time is going to be what we're looking at over the next few weeks and how time affects money. Now, Okay, we're just going to get a projector back here, but let's, uh, let's consider this example while the projector is being set up. If you're working in a company, there's currently, you're making good money on, your, on your, probably your most profitable product, and you'd like to make more of it. But there's one key issue. The distillation column, the separator that refines that product and gets it at high purity, is running 100% at capacity you cannot increase the flow rate through that distillation column anymore. You'd love to because you could be making more money by selling this product. There's a huge demand in the market for it, but you cannot make more because that column is operating at 100% capacity. One option, you can get a second distillation column. Okay. Second option, you can improve the operation in that existing distillation column by adding more trays, perhaps. Okay, so if you add a few more trays, you get a bit more separation occurring. You can take your existing column and improve it. Or the first option I mentioned, you can buy an entirely new distillation column. Let's take that first one for a minute. And in groups of two or three, I'd like you to discuss the idea. 
I know I see a few people rolling their eyes. <laughs> You're going to be doing a lot of stuff in groups of two or three in this class and discussing. So find someone and make sure you sit next to someone in the class always you enjoy discussing stuff with. And so in groups of two or three, discuss how you might go about that option. What do you need to know to buy a second distillation column and determine whether it is economically profitable? What are the sort of things you're going to need to find out? Okay, so I'll give you two, three minutes, figure out what you need to know to make that first option to build a parallel distillation column and determine its economics. Sweet. You saved me. Thank you. <laughs> I do my best. Okay, yeah, so we'll just check that out sometime. I'm not back at red. I didn't touch anything since okay. you left and came back. The other dude know <laughs> and see what they can figure out with that. Super. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate Thanks it. Again, What do you need to know, Chavez? Okay, but, okay so we're, we're buying a new distillation column. So what do you need to know to determine the economics? Okay. Okay, so what information do you need to know to figure out whether that's going to be a profitable idea? Mark. Um, how long the product might be in demand for. Okay, how long the product might be in demand for. That's going to affect your income over the next period of time. And also just like if you're buying a new distillation column just for the main purpose of producing more of that product. Yep. Okay, so what, okay, that's, a, that's a great uh, idea of risk. What if that demand collapses and disappears two, three years later? Okay, we're going to look in, into that issue about three weeks from now. What else do you need? Any other suggestions? What information? Okay. Do you buy the column just to meet that demand or do you make it a little bit bigger? The issue of what size column to purchase. How many trays, how tall, what capacity that new column will have. Okay. Anything else that you'd need to know? Brandon? Labor, cost to, uh, install. labor costs to install. After it's installed, labor costs to operate. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Will you be getting enough input? Maybe the product you're starting with running through the column, maybe you can't get enough just to pass in one of Okay, so enough raw material perhaps? Is that, is that where you're heading? Okay, do you have the raw material to, to satisfy that product demand? And also, how much is that raw material going to cost you? Right? You, do, you can't just put an extra column in there. You also now have to buy extra raw materials to keep that column working. Nicole? Do we need to buy some more land? Do we need some more space? Great. Clear? Well, maybe how you're going to finance it. Okay, who's going to pay for this thing? Okay, where's the money coming from? Good point. Anything else? The capacity of your system upstream or downstream already, so whatever upgrades we have to make to your system, we'll oh. have the extra flow through it. 
Good point. Downstream. Can downstream now handle the double the flow rate coming at it? Upstream, do you have the ability to even feed that column? Good. Okay. What, what else is there that re is required to keep that column operating day to day? What do we need? Not only raw materials and people to run it, utility costs. Okay, so you're going to have extra utility costs. So, yeah, you're going to get double the sales, but double the sales comes at quite a bit of expense, okay, to build that column, to install it, to get it up and running, to keep it operating afterwards, okay? So that's really what this course in this first few weeks is all about, is estimating those numbers. So, if we back up a, a few slides, um, this is the slide you missed we, before we started. We're going to be looking at essentially that first item there in blue, evaluating the profitability of alternative investments. That's really what engineering economics comes down to. And if you think that you don't have alternative investments, you always have an alternative. You always have at least two options. Either you keep doing what you're doing or you make a change. Okay? So even if you're considering only one new thing, you always have an alternative there immediately. Either you keep going with what you're doing or you, you make a change. And sometimes you've got two or three or four alternatives. So we're going to be looking at that later on. Now, even though this material looks like it only applies to engineering systems, you can absolutely and you should be using this in your personal life. You should be using these tools and these simple, simple equations to decide whether you should rent that first apartment or you buy that house. Okay. Do you rent your vehicle or do you buy your vehicle? Do you save and invest that extra two, three thousand dollars that's going to be burning a hole in your pocket the day you start working? Or do you use it to pay off your mortgage faster? So I can pay off my mortgage faster or I can invest that money in the stock market. Which one is a more suitable economic alternative? Where do you invest your money to save for your retirement goals? We're going to be looking at that in the tutorial on Thursday and Friday. It's some of the issues around retirement and investments. Okay, so all of this applies very much to your personal life right from the day you graduate till you retire and even beyond that. So you'll get a lot of opportunity to use these tools in this class and as well as in your work environment. If you're working in an engineering situation, but whether you're working in an engineering si uh, or not an engineering situation, maybe in the corporate world of some sort, a basic knowledge of interest, inflation, depreciation, these terms are always being thrown around in the, in the media. So just even understanding that is helpful. Now, if we go back to the section we're considering, we're looking at it at four major topics. As Kalia mentioned, time value of money is the first issue we're going to be addressing in today's class in the next, next while. Then we're going to look at how do you determine whether a process is profitable? Do you use return on investment, payback time, NPV? Which of those options do you use? How do we then go about selecting between alternatives? And then, really importantly, is that last one is cost estimation. Because if you're trying to evaluate alternatives, you need to know how much things are going to cost you. How much is a new distillation going to cost, a distillation column going to cost you? You're sitting at your desk today deciding whether you should buy that extra distillation column or not. You can't just phone up people and say, well, how much is a new distillation column? You need to be able to quickly estimate the cost of that. Okay? How do we go about doing that? And throughout that, there'll be a lot of exercises, a lot of these class interactive workshops like we've just had. Um, and then you'll be using this all in the project for this course. Okay, so, so there's a, the, those four issues there just in a little bit more detail. I don't need to repeat that. Um, let's take a look at this issue of time value of money now. So time value of money is really very, very simple to understand. There's one main idea that you need, and that's you've already learned in your second year course where you've drawn a boundary around a system and considered flows in and flows out. So that idea of a mass balance. Except we replace mass with money, and that's pretty much it. We're either having money flowing in, money flowing out, or money accumulating in a bank account. 
or not accumulating if you're going into debt. Okay? So we've got flows in and flows out out of our system. So my system is there in yellow. You've got flows in. Those are very easy to understand. Sales, you're selling your product. Your customers are paying you money for it. Maybe you've come up with some idea and you've patented it and that patent is being used to generate money. That's called a licensing fee. You're giving that patent use to another company. You say, you can go use my patent, but you need to pay me some money for it every year or for every part that you produce. That's a licensing fee. So you've got some money flowing in. And you've got a lot of money flowing out. Companies always have lots of money flowing out. Salaries, utilities, property taxes, insurance. There's a whole list of those that we'll look at throughout the course. And there's a few of them up there. Feed costs, fuel, electricity, and so forth. Okay? So those are called my cash flows. Money's flowing in and money's flowing out. Or cash is flowing in, cash is flowing out. And that boundary is your project. Now here's how we're going to visualize this. We're going to look at it on a timeline. And that timeline, we're going to draw bars that either point up if they're positive flows or negative in the downward direction. So let's take a look at that. And this is a little bit confusing for people at first. But we're going to start that line at zero. So let me perhaps can draw it for you this way. So here's January 2014 on my timeline. And that point is zero. And all the way till 31st of December, this period is my zeroth, zeroth period. This is period zero. So I sometimes write it in the middle so that people can see that this entire period is zero. So let's do that, perhaps. Okay. So all the way from the first day to the last day of the year, you've got money flowing in, money flowing out. And we report the net of that on the last day of the year. So you've got all this money, people paying you for your product. You're paying a lot of salaries, utilities, raw materials. You calculate all the incomes minus all the expenses. What's left over is either going to be a positive number or a negative number. And you draw that line up or down on the last day of the period. Okay, so let's say at that last day, your net cash flow is a negative. So we perhaps draw, just to keep this consistent, we'll draw a negative red. And that length of that line is proportional to the value that, we've, that we're in negative. Then comes 1st of January 2015. So that's this point over here is 1st of January 2015. And now you're into what we call period one. Okay, period one, you get money flowing in again, money flowing out. And it might be that at the end of period one, you've got a positive net balance, just a small positive bar like that. Okay, we're going to pretty much always in engineering system, our period, that duration of time is going to be one year. That's a reasonable duration because many of our projects last 20, 30 years. So we're going to have about 20, 30 periods. We would be doing too much work if we were trying to look at things on a monthly basis or a daily basis. Okay, so an annual basis is usually a pretty good period of time to consider. Also within a year, the time value of money doesn't change too much. I'm going to talk a bit about that in a minute. So within one period, the time value of money is pretty constant. So that's a good assumption as well to consider a period of one year. But where people get confused is this notion that that first period is zero. And you'll see why we use that coming up soon. That's not, it's your first period, but we call it n equals zero. So lowercase n equals zero in that first period. A little bit different to the business school notation that's sometimes used by the engineering and management students. Engineering and management students actually have the most problem with this course because they come with a whole lot of conceptual baggage, that thinking of things in a slightly different way. 
Okay, so you have to undo a little bit of that, but the results are really no different, and you can prove that to yourself as well. Okay, so this slide summarizes this idea that within one period, you've got a lot of money flowing in. So within that one period, you've got money flowing in, you've got money flowing out, but we report the net of that. The, the net result is reported at the end of the period. That's going to be our convention in this course. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay, now let's give this a go for yourself. Consider your life from age 10 to age 40 and use periods of five years and draw your previous cash flow history and your anticipated cash flow history from time 10 to age 40, sorry, from age 10 to age 40 using periods of about five years. So give that a try and see what your cash flow diagram would look like for your personal life. Both. Like we're just looking from 10 to 40, yeah. Yeah. You can, yeah, just start rough. It's, it's just an idea to get you comfortable with what flows are, right? So when you're age 10, do you have money flowing in or money flowing out mostly? Okay, and if you've done projecting to age 40, keep projecting till as far as you'd like to go. Okay, so let's take a look. Anyone want to say whether at age 20, let's just start at, at roughly the age where you guys are all at. Age 20, anyone positive flows, negative flows? <laughs> Big negative. <laughs> okay, so lots of student debt, lots of housing costs, lots of food costs, tuition costs, and so forth. What was it five years prior to that? Maybe small positives if your parents were paying you an allowance. But if you spent all of that allowance, then it was zero, right? So money flowing in, money flowing out. Remember, you're reporting the net over here. So if you had money saved up when you were age 15, you were probably a pretty good saver. <laughs> okay, so most of us would have had small positives or small negatives here in the earlier years. But from age 20, you're seriously into most of your money is flowing out. You've got more money flowing out than flowing in, for some of you. What is it going to look like when you're 25? You're hoping it's up there. <laughs> Realistically, somewhere down here, right? So hopefully you're positive, but it might be just that you're just starting to pay off your student loans and just starting to pay off some housing costs and down payments on a house and a car or whatever your plans are for the future. Travel. Age 30. Positive. 
hopefully. <laughs> I hope. I hope it's like that for you. I really do. Um, what is it going to look like after that? Okay, you, <laughs> you're going to have kids. <laughs> Okay, so it might be a little bit variable. Some years are better than others. But then when you retire, what's happening here? Negative? Zero? Remember, this is the net. When you retire, you have no money flowing in. Yeah, you have money flowing in and flowing out. And provided you're balancing that, you're at zero. But hope, maybe you're still making money here, you, even though you've retired. And then later on in your life, you start getting the negatives when you're paying for health care costs and other costs, and maybe you're traveling more. You're spending all that accumulated money that you've, you've got so you don't leave any to your children. Okay? <laughs> so that's the idea of cash flow diagrams. It's the total income minus total expenses within a period of time. And what you can do is you can take those cash flow diagrams and you can create what we call the cumulative sum. So up at the top was the cash flow diagram that we've just drawn. You've got some negative flows, some positive flows. And then in this lower diagram, we start adding them up and creating the cumulative sum. What you can see is there where it crosses zero. You're now at a point at what we say you've broken even. Your total income is equal to your total expenses over that total period of time. And beyond that, you start going positive, so you, you're building up money. The cumulative cash flow is essentially the accumulation in that boundary. So remember, mass flowing in, mass flowing out is equal to the accumulation. That cumulative diagram there is telling you what that accumulation is over the period, over the history. Okay, so we simply can take those, that first representation and, and create the cumulative sum and plot that over time. We'll definitely use the first one a lot more than the second one, but the second one has some good use when you're trying to convince your boss that your project is the one that she or he should be investing in. You want to show your boss that, look, I'm going to cost you a lot of money initially, but I'm going to quickly start making a profit for you. This is a great way to demonstrate that visually. Okay, so let's think about the time value of money. In engineering, you're very comfortable with the idea of equivalence. Okay? If I tell you something is 24 inches, you know that that's equal to 2 feet. Okay? And you can convert that 2 feet to a metric representation as well. We've, we're very comfortable exchanging one set of units for another set of units. Time value of money does exactly the same thing. We're exchanging money right now for money in the future. So let's ask this question. If a really good family member is asking you to borrow $100 and she promises that in three years' time she'll give you that $100 back as is, is that a good investment? It depends. What does it depend on? Okay, inflation and deflation. So if you were living in, a in certain countries, that might actually be a good deal. But in Canada, that's not a good deal. Okay. Why is it not a good deal? What could you have been doing with that $100? You could have invested it. There's the risk that that really good family member runs away and doesn't ever give you the $100 back, okay, or just refuses to. Uh, so there's risk on your side, and you want to be paid for that risk. When you borrow money from the bank to buy your car, or you're buying a house from the bank, that money charges, the bank charges you interest. They're charging you that because there's a risk that they may not get that money back ever again. So one way that they do that is by charging you interest on it. So the notion of risk and interest is very much tied together over there. And we're very comfortable with this idea that money now is worth less in the future. $100 today is not worth the same as $100 two, three years from now. You've all heard your family members say, back in my day, a loaf of bread was 50 cents, yada, yada, yada. So you've all heard that thing, right? So right now, a loaf of bread is a buck 50 or a buck 20, whatever you're paying. There's an idea that, that money hasn't got a static value over time. It changes value over time. And we need to take that into account. 
The reason why we take that into account in engineering systems is because of that idea that our processes last for 20, 30 years. So you have to take the time value of money into account. If you were only dealing with a process that was two, three years in duration, you could make reasonable calculations with no great error. But our processes don't exist for two, three years. They exist over longer periods of time, and so we must take time value of money into account. Let's see. We use the idea of an interest rate to do this. Okay? And I'm going to give you two ways to see time value of money. Today we're going to look at it from an interest rate point of view. Next class we're going to look at it from an inflation perspective. But let's take a look at the easier one to understand perhaps right now is the interest rate perspective. So let me ask you this. Oh, let me first show you some representation and some notation and then I'll, I'll give you an example quick. We're going to use the following representation. For our cash flow diagrams, you've seen this now before, but we're going to say the value of money, if I show you a bill today, a $20 bill, that's the present value P. It's the money you have in your hand right now. In the future, that value is going to be something different. And we're going to use an interest rate I to tell us how different that is. And N is how many steps into the future we're considering. So n equals 1 is 1 year into the future. n equals 2 is 2 years into the future. So let me ask you this example before I go to that slide. If I have $100 invested in a bank account, $100 in a bank account, and I'm earning 10% interest annually, what's going to be the balance in my bank account one year from now? $100 in my bank today, a year from now, 110 Okay, everyone? Yeah? Okay, so $100 today, basically you've just done time value of money there. $100 today is 110 a year from now. It's no different to us in engineering saying 12 inches is equal to one foot. Except we're, we're instead of looking at measurements, we're looking at money over time. $100 today equals $110 a year from now. The present value P is 100. The future value F is 110. Let's take a look at that using a bit of that notation. So my present value is 100, my future value is 110. The interest rate was 10%. One way you can calculate the interest rate is as follows. You can say, well, 110 minus 100 divided by what I started with is equal to 0.5. Let's write that in, in a formula. F, my future value, minus my present value, divided by my present value, is equal to my interest rate I. And there's the time value of money formula for one period. So for one year, let's maybe emphasize that, F, one year from now, so F1, one year from now, minus the present value, divided by what I started with, gives me my interest rate I. Let's rearrange that a little bit. It says that my future value a year from now, F1, is my present value plus the present value times the interest rate. So sub in some numbers there just to get an idea of this. It's 100 plus 100 times 0.1. So that's 100 plus $10 that you earn in interest is your future value, F1. Okay, so this is, this is the formula for the first year.
Now, time doesn't stop there. We can keep going with this. So if I reinvest that money for another year, what is my balance going to be? 121, okay? Because I'm going to take that $100 plus the $10 I've accumulated, invest it again for another year at 10%, I'm going to get $121. So we get what we call a recursive formula being built up here. The way you can see that is, let's say my balance two years from now is my balance that I started with, F1, plus F1 times the interest rate I. Okay, so at the end of that second year, you take what you had in the first year plus the interest rate portion, and you get this recursive formula being set up. Now, I can substitute in what F1 is over here. So I can sub in that formula. F1 is equal to P plus PI. That's that portion. F1 is P plus PI times I. And if you simplify that, you get F2 is equal to P plus 2 times PI plus PI squared. Or if we use the quadratic relationship, that comes down to P 1 plus I raised to the 2. And so in general, if we repeat that a third time and a fourth time, we can create a recursive formula, which I'll show you in a minute. Let me give you a chance to use this example now. Use those formulas up there and, and follow example one. Maybe you don't even need a calculator. You can do this in your head. If you would like $1,000 a year from now, but you only have $800 to invest, what interest rate do you need to have? Twenty-five percent. Okay, so you'd like a thousand dollars from now, a year from now. You've got eight hundred dollars to invest. We simply use this formula that's up here. Your thousand dollars now minus eight hundred divided by eight hundred, and that's twenty-five percent interest rate that you need. So you need to go find somewhere that you can get twenty-five percent in interest. Is that feasible? Can you find somewhere that gets you twenty-five percent interest? Maybe a pyramid scheme somewhere. <laughs> okay, probably not. Okay, let's take example two. You'd like a future value of $1,000 one year from now. If interest rates are 4%, and that's, that's a, you can find investments with 4% interest rates. How much should you invest today to get $1,000 a year from now at 4% interest? What are you solving for? P. You know F. You know F is 1,000. You know I is 0 0.04. So solve for P. Anyone got a value for me? Let's maybe use that formula, write it in a little bit more useful way. F1 is equal to P1 plus I. Okay. So solve that for P is equal to F1 divided by 1.04. Well, firstly, intuitively, are you going to need more than $1,000 or less than $1,000? 
less, okay? And we see that in the formula, 1,000 divided by 1.04 gets you your answer, okay? Whatever that is. So a simple, simple formula. It's really the basis of all the work we're going to do is this very simple equation that relates present values to future values. And there it is for the case of multiple time periods. So I've considered and shown you here on the board for one period when n, lowercase n is equal to 1. But we're going to be working over multiple periods. And that's the formula then over there. Okay. So one way to ask the question is, if you want to have $1,000 one year from now, two years from now, three, four, five, whatever n is, how much do you need to invest right now if interest rates remain at, say, 10%? So we're always going to be able to convert from present values to future values. And you can go do this very easily, and you should be doing this in a spreadsheet. So I'd like you to go home and try this. You can go look at the spreadsheet that's posted on the course website. I'll put the link up there later today. Right now, the link isn't there. But see if you can go reproduce that, that plot. So let's take a look at that. This plot shows that, let's take a look at the column. There's a row there, period N. And there's an entry there called 621. Let me see if I can find my laser pointer. Right, there we go. OK, so period N equals 5 has a value of 621. That says you need to invest $621 now at interest rates of 10% so that in six years' time you'll have $1,000. So $621 will grow to $683, will grow to $751, then to $826, then to $909, and then in the sixth year you will have $1,000 in your bank account. Notice that N is equal to 5, but it's six years. And that's because of the period zero. Everyone makes mistakes on this the first time. But please pay attention to that. The first period is n equals zero. And the reason why we use n equals zero is because of this convention over here. What happens when n is equal to zero? If you've got zero periods, what does that bracket simplify to? To one, which says your future value is your present value in that first period. That's the only reason why we use n equals 0 for the first period. It's not to trick you, but it's, it makes our calculations a whole lot easier if we do that. OK? Everyone clear on that? OK. Now here's the question. What is a reasonable interest rate? What is the interest rate currently in Canada? 4%, 2%? OK, you can always go look this up. Here's the most recent values. Um, there's the link. You can't see it very clearly here, but it's on the course website. Currently in Canada, interest rates in government bonds for three months, a three-month government bond gets you 1.2. If you're going to give the government your money for 10 years, they'll give you 2% interest rates. OK, you can do better. You can go give your money to the Turkish government and get 9% interest rates. I cut Russia off. Russia was a little bit low. Oh, wait, there's Russia, 9.5%. So if you give the Russian government your money, they'll give you 9.5% interest rates. But do you want to give the Russian government your money right now? Why not? There's a risk that you may not get that money back. OK, two years ago, Greece wasn't at 5.8%. Two, three years ago with the European crisis in Greece, that number was a whole lot higher. OK, so interest rates always reflect risk. The investing environment in United States, Japan, Britain, Canada, very stable, very reliable, but you get low interest rates. Okay? So you can always get a sense of what a reasonable interest rate is by looking at these sorts of diagrams and charts. And you should be keeping up to date with this. The reason is quite, quite clear why you should be doing this, because probably about half of you will not be working in Canada in 20 years from now. You'll be working in countries all over the world. So 
having this idea in your mind that a 2% interest rate or 5% interest rate is reasonable is not going to be the case for you where you're working a few years from now. Okay, so bear, bear that in mind. And in Wednesday's class, we'll be looking at this from an inflation perspective.